U2 and we have ranked their whole uh, discographies. I wasn't recording. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no problem, no problem. <laughs> sorry, sorry, okay. no problem. Hey everybody, this is Shane and Niall here from the Overrated Podcast, uh, a podcast which deals with um, music critiques of bands and artists and critiques also of filmmakers, um, you know, in-depth critiques in fact. Uh, so far we've covered two bands, The Divine Comedy was the first band we covered and uh, U2 and we uh, ranked their uh, albums, we went through their whole discographies and we uh, critiqued and analysed and ranked all their albums. So for today we're actually doing our first filmmaker of the bunch and I, I, I just a little bit more like there is an Irish connection to both Divine Comedy and U2. Now we're not going to be doing exclusively Irish but we are uh, taking a director, a writer-director that has certainly connections to Ireland. Um, his name is Martin McDonough. I'm sure many people will be familiar with him. He has, he's primi primarily known as, or at least he broke out as a playwright. Um, some of his most famous plays being uh, Skull and Connemara, The Beauty Queen of the Nan, The Pillow Man. He's got plenty more very, very well um, praised and successful uh, uh, plays, but we're not going to be um, critiquing the plays, we're going to be critiquing his four films. His first one was In Bruges, his second was Seven Psychopaths, his third was The Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and his fourth was, and the most recent one, is The Banshees of Inner Sharon. So Mildred Hayes, um, she's the mother of uh, a daughter who was uh, uh, raped while dying, killed and raped. Uh, and she is um, the uh, basically the police. Uh, she feels like the police haven't done enough to investigate the case. And so she pays for billboards, you know, massive billboards on a, a kind of a road that isn't well traveled anyway to be where uh, to be put up. And it's raped. Uh, the, the three billboards say raped while dying. Um, what, how come and no arrests how come will uh, Chief Willock be that's, that's the, those are the three things so that's the, the hook that gets you into the film uh, and then so I suppose uh, the film kind of explores I think the, the aim of the film is to try and ex, uh, explore the the, the, uh, to, so the grief yeah. the grief how um, uh, Mildred how Francis McDormand's character Mildred uh, is dealing with the grief and how society, how the society around her is dealing with her own reaction to the grief. And then there's obviously other plots like, like oh, spoiler alert, um, Chief Willoughby has, uh, has, has cancer and that's been, you know, and that, that obviously has been uh, put towards, uh, uh, you know, put to um, Mil Mildred. Uh, as a way for her to take down, come on, this isn't fair. This guy is dying of cancer. This isn't fair to for him for him to have to deal with this. So I think what McDonough is trying to do there is he's 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 trying to probe the audience. He's trying trying to dare you because the Francis McDormand character is acting like uh, a bitch the whole you know like the whole film basically like she you know in ordinary circumstances you think that she you know is being totally unreasonable okay but be, but but he's daring you to dislike her while also uh, there's other character in it like that you know a police officer is played by sam rockwell um who is his name is dixon who is really um kind of really racist uh you know uh really racist a kind of a nasty sort of character and what he's doing, he's trying to dare you to dislike the the woman who has, um, you know, who has had her mur daughter uh, murdered and raped, while daring you to kind of empathize with. Um, it seems now is he daring? I don't know. It seems like 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 uh, like that's happening. Um, but I suppose I I tell you what. Um, there's lots of things to say about this 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 film. But I'll just start off with what did you, what what did you like about it? What did you, what did you like or dislike about it? Uh, well, the main thing I liked about it is, is the pacing, and this is one thing I think that is one of the positives on many of the McDonough films, apart from maybe Seven Psychopaths, but the rest of them I think really well paced. And I think the in introductory sequence is a really good example of of, of great pacing and really keeps like the in 
I think the first scene is Francis McDormand's character driving along, seeing the billboards, and then you start thinking, well, what's what's in her mind here? What's going on here? You, you're 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 interested straight away, and then she goes into the agency. She puts down the money, and says, well, why? Like then, so then you answer one question. Okay, she wants to. Why is she interested? What she wants to put up an ad, and then she says, well, what's the ad about? And then your your man in the agency says, oh, you're whatever the daughter's name was, and the mother of her, and he goes, oh yeah. And then you start thinking, well, what's that all about? Every time there's a question answered, another one is raised, and a more interesting one. And you're you're always pulled into it, and then you see the, you know, the rape and murder, raped while dying, I think is the phrase used, the really shocking type of thing, and you're, you know, you're pulled in even more. Um, really, like, excellent. I thought that was, and that's that's true throughout the whole thing. Another thing that, that's really good, I think, is just the general interactions that in terms of the dialogue. Now, the dialogue itself, not... No, you can raise questions about it, but actually the um, the pacing of the dialogue and the interactions were really good, and it's really you know you, you when you're listening to the conversation, you're really into it, you're really part of it. That was really good. I think the weakness is terms of, for me is like the direction and how things were set up and how things were done and executed, absolutely excellent as far as I could see. The the weakness for me would be more the writing, like the actual dialogue that's there. Behind it, I don't feel is as good. And I think a really good example of that is where one of the opening scenes and she comes home, and I think it's a police, no, it's a priest in, in the house. And she has this story about the priests and she said, like, being part of the priesthood is a bit like being part of part of a gang. And if you're, when you sign up to a gang, like you sign up and you're part, you're in. And if one, one member of the gang uh, does wrong, well, no, you're all on the hook for that. And I was thinking... But first of all, the way she delivers it, it's like she's reading off a Wikipedia article. And like you're sort of saying, it's it's McDonough channeling his views in through the characters and coming out. It's very Aaron Sorkin-esque. Um, you know Aaron Sorkin who did A Few Good Men, uh, Social Network, you know that kind of dialogue, West yeah. Wing and all that. It's 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 it it's totally takes away from the realism of the, the character when she's delivering this kind of, you know... It's like she's reading per- an article. Yeah, per- you're reading an article, perfectly delivering this speech. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you're you're right. It's kind of. Uh, it but but the other thing as well, I, I don't even agree with the, the the analogy because if you're going into a if you're joining a gang, you know what you're getting into. You're going like it's illegal activity. You're going to be on the hook for some illegal activities. If you're joining the priesthood, well, you're 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 in, you're uh, hopefully you're going in for the reasons of religion and all that sort of stuff. You're not going in for the bad things that that tend that has happened. So I don't think I don't think it works in that in that regard. But. That's an aside. The main thing is, I suppose, the type of dialogue. Yeah, but 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 at the same time, uh, in the film, it's presented as as her being badass. The priest at the end of it is silenced. Yeah. The son makes a is you know has a big smile on his face. So the audience is is is, is presumably at, it's supposed to take that as Mildred being badass, the police being the the bad or the priest being the bad guy here. Um, so yeah, that like like I'm glad you brought that. I was gonna I was gonna bring up that that scene as well because I I kind of had a, a problem with that scene too. Um, but I suppose like it's the character of Mildred is an interesting one really um, because look McDon- McDormand does her very very best and gives it socks basically, but she's basically in one a one in in one mode the whole film. Yeah. It's just rage anger and like i feel like you would you could you, it's harder to like i don't i do empathize somewhat with her and i do like her more than maybe the characters in seven psychopaths and um, but i just say it's very much she's she's angry throughout she doesn't really you don't really see any other side of her personality like there's a moment where it there's a flashback to when the daughter was alive but they're arguing and it's like you still see that argue, ar- angry part of her. You don't like if, for example, you saw the more loving, caring part of her. Well, then you'd be more that would you'd be more empathetic towards her, I feel. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm, maybe, maybe there is a moment like that. In it. Yeah, but then if you saw the loving part of her, like, you know, like you could easily see that as a character, as a writer manipulating you and say, look, she used to be lovely. Now she's like, that could have been an easy answer. But everybody, but I mean, everybody's complex. Like everybody's angry at times and everybody's <laughs> loving up. Like we're all, that's, that's the, the facets of the human condition. And if we just saw a part of her, it would help us to understand why she's angry then. Um, like I kind of like I think they're, they're yeah they're just I don't know why they have that flashback because it's just an argument like it doesn't doesn't add anything much 
But maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely missing something there. Yeah, well, I, I want to go to... I, I definitely want to return to the to flashback scene because I think it's wor- definitely worth talking about because I think it's, it's kind of problematic. But um, but uh, yeah, going back to the McDormand character, um, it seems to me like the, the Mildred, she's just kind of one-dimensional. It's kind of one mode, just pure rage. But I, I have a few quotes here, if you don't mind, from McDonough about what he has had to say about about this um, this character. So um, he says, I don't think I've written a character as strong as her, let alone before, let alone a female character. McDonough recently told Vanity Fair. There was something quite joyful and exciting about writing someone so outrageous. That's why I think I'll keep doing it. Seeing the reaction to this character, someone who's doing stuff that you wouldn't have seen a, a woman do for a long time, if at all, who's not trying to placate an audience or ask any favours, that's exciting to write as a dramatist, okay? A few other little points about this. Um, so McDormand was on board from the beginning, pushing McDonough even further in developing the character's strengths. There would be no crying. You know, McDonough did, uh, McDormand didn't want any crying, even in the few tender moments when she uh, is alone with her thoughts. I think she, uh, this is what he, uh, McDonough says, I think she had determined that audience are seeing actors crying too much on screen these days. Fair enough. Fine. Don't have a problem with that. Well, unless you do. Yeah, I don't think uh, crying in particular is fine. If you don't want to cry, then that's fine. But I mean, some sort of, some sort of more like uh, there are quite moments where she's a bit more emotional maybe but i don't know i still uh, i still felt like she was in angry mode <laughs> basically but anyway yeah go on sorry go on in yeah so um and then he, this is another thing he mentions uh, uh you know this uh, i love the idea of the war uniform the other way she's always in the same kind of blue kind of uniform but i thought maybe at the end she might wear a dress but mcdonough uh uh, said, but Francis then said, "Why would I dress up? I'm still at war. Nothing's been solved. So, like, even when she was going on uh, for dinner with you, with uh, um, the dwarf character played by Peter Dinklage, who I can't remember the name, she she was still wearing this kind of. It's almost like something a mechanic would wear, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so another thing here, and, and this is my last quote. I'm going to say, and before I kind of get into it, uh, she blinks once, I think, uh, and you can read the vitriol in that. McDonough said, um. Sam and I are always talking, this is Sam Rockwell, about seeing Taxi Driver when we were kids. And obviously, the Bickle, you know, Billy Bickle, the psycho from... Uh, uh, Travis Bickle. Oh. Yeah, is a, yeah, is a kind of reference to Travis Bickle. You know, uh, hardly a very good... Um, kind of oh, who's like, Billy Bickle? Which one is he? He was the Sam Rockwell character from Seven Psychopaths. Oh, really? Okay, right. But it almost kind of feels like a lame kind of uh, tribute to, you know... Yeah, I, yeah. Bickle, whatever, but... Um, so, so ba- basically, they're talking about seeing Marilyn Brando or James Dean or Montgomery Cliff, people who, as a young boy, you act like, you scratch yourself like, you walk into a bar like. And I was thinking, 12-year-old girls don't have someone who they can walk into a bar and be like and be cool. I want little girls to have someone to walk into a bar and be like, and I hope Mildred is the first of many. What do you think of that? What was that last line? I want little I'll girls. Go, so basically, he was saying that we, when yeah. I was young, we had the Marlon Brandos, we had the, tra- yeah. the taxi drivers, James Deans. But 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 uh, you know, boys, young boys, you wanted to act like you wanted to scratch yourself, like you wanted to be in, walk into a bar, like. And I was thinking, twelve year old girls don't have someone who they can walk into a bar and be like and be cool. I want little girls to have someone to walk into a bar and be like. And I hope Mildred is the first of many. But there's many, there's many good female characters. In general, so like he's assuming that there haven't been any. Like yeah, yeah, he says this. Yeah, yeah you're actually you're exactly right. He he literally says this, and he, and says this is the type of type of person that somebody should be. Like, um, I can't I can't think of any examples now. Unfortunately, though, like strong female characters, good female characters in, in films, like, um, well, like this, you know, like Tom and Louise, um. <laughs> we might have to edit this out like, you know it's kind of like one of those uh, <laughs> next thing is you know boom, yeah, yeah, yeah. all these all these great know. ones jumping from Gotha to Gotha no look there's, there's loads there's the recent um, uh, film uh, made by the guy who made um, oh Annihilation which um, what's that girl who's in Jackie and um, can't the actress oh my sister thinks she's gorgeous what's her name uh, she's in Jackie. She's in uh, Leon when she was a kid. She Natalie Portman. Uh, Natalie yeah, Portman. Yeah. yeah. So no, look at this. Ah, look, there's 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 so many like. Uh, but also, there's an assumption there that this is the sort of uh, person. 
that you should aspire to be. Um, that the um, what do you call it? Francis McDormand character. It's, it's just re- somebody's angry. obviously from Alien. Now, obviously, there's no doubt about it. There has been way less of these. You know, like there's been, it, it, like it's the balance of representation. Uh, still, yeah. and particularly in history, but still very much the case that the balance of rep- representation has been, you know, so dis- disproportionately tipped in favour of men. So, like, we were we are going to movies, we were seeing Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington in the main, you know, and uh, always the main characters in action films, but, yeah. but you know, even in dramas, we're seeing more films with men. So, like, there's a hundred percent a legitimate point uh, to be made about that, but. At, I remember at the time, 2016, it came out in 2017. 2016 was kind of like the Me Too movement and then like in the whole thing with um, that guy from Miramax, what's his name, uh, Harvey Weinstein, and just all these stories came out, you know, Kevin Spacey, even Hollywood and, and so, so on. And and I think uh, McDonough kind of, um, you know, he jumped on, not, not, I'm not saying he did it cynically, like, but, but kind of, you know, this film, just even though he wrote this film before all that happened, I think he was in the zeitgeist and he felt, wow, this is, so he himself thought this is a great time for this film to come out because I'm sending out a really feminist message, um, uh, you know, with, with my calling out about kind of uh, victims of rape and so on. But I think if you kind of scratch beneath the th- surface, I think there's, it. it's not really a very, uh, very powerful feminist message being being sent uh, being being presented or being provided in this film at all so for example um the rape case is kind of uh, he, he is presented as the kind of the whole rape cliche of you know somebody jumping out of the bushes kind of like you know when in reality this is kind of you know it, it, it reinforces this kind of cliche that it's all oh, rape is something that happens kind of like by this, these bad guys in the bushes that you know these when in reality like the statistics have showed that um that most rape victims are raped by people who um who are who are known to them and an often case quite close to them so that's one uh, kind of reinforcement um yeah and again his depiction of misogyny like that guy who comes uh, who co- like remember the, f- the scene of this kind of creepy guy who goes into the kind of the, the shop and starts kind of walking towards Mildred and kind of going maybe uh, I'm a friend of Chief Willoughby or maybe oh, I'm a yeah. friend of your daughter maybe I was uh, killed maybe I killed her and raped her and, and in, it's like it's kind of a really cringe scene really because it's almost like you know because every time he says these things, she goes, "Were you? Did you? Are you? You know, yeah. uh, it's almost like kind of big bad wolf. You know, <laughs> what big eyes you've got? <laughs> Only to see, you know, like it was kind of like I always got that. That t- really took me out of it because it just kind of <laughs> felt so fake. But in any case, um, uh, like he's kind of the misogynist. He's kind of depicted. It's just kind of depicted like like this kind of caricature, uh, evil guy. You know, really yeah. horrible guy. Where you know most feminists would argue that no misogyny is much more insidious than that. Than what 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 is going on? Another kind of aspect of it is, is that. You know, obviously this was a, you know, and, and he's actually been open about this. This has been a conscious decision to have write a main character that is female. Uh, uh, after he got the criticism of seven psychopaths, you know, like he, you know, he, you know, he, he made this point about. Um, I have written about most of his plays, kind of are dominated by male characters, but not all of them. Um, I think the main one I've seen, which I've seen recently, was the Beauty Queen of uh, Linan, um, which uh, you know, and I saw it. And in fairness, the main uh, character now there's two uh, main characters who are women, which is kind of an old woman. Who's been looked after at home by her um, her daughter, um, who's not really happy. Kind of, you know, it's about kind of loneliness, you know, which is a team that he comes back to again. And in fairness, she is a f- pretty. Uh, she is a, a well, like all these old women characters that I've ever come across. All I always seem to be, especially in this film, like you know, um, Sam Rockwell's um, mother is like they're all kind of just really tend to be just kind of one dimensional. Uh, bitter characters, you know, like, but the other woman, now I'd have to say the, 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 the woman who played the, the main ca- character in that play was out- outstanding, exceptional. So uh, that was a f- fairly well-rounded female character. But in this one, this is a one-dimensional character. And I think that when he talks about strong characters, is like, I have this thing that 
he has this notion of like I, I don't think he necessarily has a problem with female characters, but it, I feel like he's got a problem with femininity. Like, why does a female character have to be kind of going around acting like Denzel Washington from men, uh, from Man on Fire? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, like why why is that a strong character? Like, yeah. you know, burning buildings, you know, just full of rage. It's kind of like you know. Jeez, this if anything, this world needs less toxic masculinity, not more of it. So the, don't be pre- provide, providing this, this just because she's a woman. She is behaving the exact way. She's not confronting her own anger. She's just she she is is in pure anger mode. She and 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 she's lashing out by using violence in, often in this in this film. Like this, your textbook tenets of what toxic masculinity is, and uh, and and he's he's he's. Uh, put, putting her up as as in as if she's some beacon of of hope for for young girls to look up to and be cool like, uh, when actually she's just a, um, a textbook example of toxic uh, what toxic masculinity can do to you. Yeah. And like he, I like I've never seen him write femininity. So I've talked enough. No, there. but you have summed it up. Now, like I was just going to say, one thing I do think about the character is she's not something not something that you want to aspire to like she's not a nice person she doesn't come across as being a nice person she doesn't deal with it in a nice way but I think you've summed it up in a much more eloquent and well developed uh, summary than what what I would have thought thank you thank you I spent a whole half hour last night (laughs) trying to figure out this 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 point Um, yeah and and the, another thing that McDonough gets credit for is that because because he's kind of daring you because he's not you know he often gets credit for McDonough never he never uh, per, never provides you with easy answers never provides you with easy answers he always kind of like you know like it's like it's like it's he gets credit just because he doesn't wrap things up in you know in in, in an easy bow and I he often he, I've seen that in in people talk about him that way I've seen that in reviews yeah. that it's just that he, he that he gets this sort of credit for for you know things not being wrapped up in a bow or whatever like it's such a low bar to 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 to, to um to thing, jump you know? yeah but one thing on that so like this film isn't wrapped up in a bow and at the end of the film you see them driving off to go and maybe pursue somebody who may be maybe uh, the, the the killer. But uh, you think, like for a start, sometimes you get that in films where you're left wondering what's going to happen next. And I think that that can be a great film. A lot of cases, one of my, fav- my favourite moments of films is when I'm walking out and I'm still trying to think about well, what, what's going on there. But usually that's that follows a moment where you do have a climax, you do have the ebb and flow of the film and it reaches a peak and it comes back down and maybe it reaches a peak in terms of plot, but there's still elements of character left to be determined. In here, we don't really reach the peak of the plot. We have, okay, there's a situation where, oh, maybe this was the guy. And actually, no, it's not the guy. And I sort of, it's like a dab squib. It doesn't really resonate at all. But then... He leaves it open, but one thing, this is one thing that maybe brings us on, segues into another point about him is that he gives you the sort of, he tells you exactly what's going to happen. It's like, it's like in Austin Powers where you had the Austin Powers' boss is called Basil Exposition and he would he'd tell you, he, he was like a joke of the fact that he was telling you the exposition and the story, the build up, the background to the story. And he does exactly like, there's loads of Basil Exposition moments in this film and one of them is at the very end where there are, cop, there are two of them Mildred and Sam Rockwell's character hopping in the car to go off and try and find the murder. And you're think I was th- when I was watching, I was thinking, okay, are they gonna, are they gonna kill him or what are they gonna do? And then, and I uh, and I was sort of figuring out what's going to happen here. And then they sort of they have the, exactly that discussion. And you're thinking, right, you know, we got there ourselves. You didn't have to tell us it. You didn't have to tell us what was going to happen. And that is maybe a little bit more subtle, but there's other moments there with like the letters from Woody Harrelson's character to everybody, and he explains backgrounds to characters without actually telling you like showing you what's going to happen for example the letter he wrote to sam rockwell's character to say and we know you've had a bad time your dad has died and and you know you, you you're angry and there's a reason and you know and you're allowed to be angry and i think all oh, right okay well that's an important piece of information and it guides you back towards a moment of where you start to understand a bit more about his character and then you feel a bit more sympathy towards him but you, sh- you should see some elements of this. Like, like there's loads of opportunities for him to do that. Like, he's sitting down having dinner with his mother and they're just arguing. There could have been something there about it that you could have brought it in in a way that helped to, you know, be more invested with him. Um, 
And that would be yeah, that'd be my, one of my main criticisms. Yeah, I suppose like ex- exposition in any movie is is absolutely necessary. You need ex- exposition. But what the great writers do is that they they um, inject the exposition without you noticing it. Without you know without so so if you start noticing the exposition, it takes you out of the reality of what you're watching. Like so, I do think I agree with you. I think that in this film, the exposition is a little bit clumsier, um, which. Do you know what? Which I suppose there's other points I wanted to go go to, but we could go on to them, and then we take a break after maybe this 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 one because there's a lot to be said, and I think like you know, <laughs> yeah. like th- there is. A, in fact, in some ways, I've got more to say about this film than the two films that I think are better, um, because it was a very highly celebrated film at the time. There, you know, it did have some backlash, but in general, generally speaking, speaking, it was very well received. Um, but you you make the point about the kind of exposition and this notion always about does it ring true where. The Chief Willoughby character, spoiler alert, um, it, he uh, basically has got cancer. He's got a loving wife, two beautiful daughters. It shows him the day before he died. It shows him um, uh, having a, a wonderful day with him. And then he commits suicide. Okay, so look, whether you believe that or not, I think suicide itself is fine. Like it makes sense. Uh, it fits in with the character. The character is a tough guy. He doesn't want to. He doesn't. Want, and he knows he's going to die eventually, so he doesn't want to go through the whole, you know, sickness and everything. He just wants to get it over and done with. And maybe if it it, it, it ties in with the fact that he's a tough guy, and he doesn't want to be seen as being weak. So all that sort of make rings true to me. But but. But uh, the one thing is that he, he's a tough guy, but he's also s- comes across as a, uh, the chief Willoughby guy as a guy who's totally loyal to his family and like suicide. But probably he probably comes up and grows up in a kind of environment which would kind of see suicide in itself being a weakness, you know. Um, so yeah. it, like in the, the letter to his wife, look, I didn't mind the letter to his wife where he wrote a letter to his wife and he says he gave her the reason he says, that was the best day of my life there today and I didn't want to see your face as I got weaker and weaker I I, I knew y- you know that wouldn't be fair on you but I don't know like like if he's been honest with himself you know sh- she was devastated about woken up her kids were devastated they didn't get to properly say goodbye you know like yeah. that means a lot so so I uh, look, it, that's it, it. That's it. That's it's interesting. It's thought provoking, kind of uh, whether he, sh- you know, whether it's believable that he did it is is one thing. But it's it. Uh, but it, even if you if you can believe it, fine. It's still a, kind of a thought provoking thing where you think if you're going to die, what's what's the morally right thing to do? And sometimes McDonough does pose interesting questions like that. Well, you know, like about things like that. But then he writes a letter to Mildred and <laughs> gives her you know like like it, the man is going to die this is a this is a really big decision in his life it's a really tough decision in his life and like his family surely his family are, are the most important thing possible for for him before he does this but then he goes around sending this you know spending spray like a, a string of letters to you know to Mildred who, who presumably he doesn't really have much of a personal relationship with but he, he still feels on the day before he kills himself <laughs> he you know a writes a kind of a motivation letter and, by the way here's some money I'm not going to leave it to my family I'm just going to give it to you so why not you know yeah, yeah. and then and then he you know you're in a suicidal state of mind and, but you're still writing motivational letters to to uh and to the colleagues and everything. Colleagues like like the racist guy. And there's very, very little in the film. It's kind of, this literally comes down to just one scene where they're both looking uh, uh, to get, there's two scenes, uh, or three scenes together with them. And there's one where he's just saying, you know what, says to another cop, like, uh, this guy's not so bad, right? So he, that's how we know that he has some kind of uh, uh, liking for the Sam Rockwell uh, character uh, despite everything there's another uh, short scene where they where they're looking for evidence at the billboards of uh, of, of angela who's uh, mildred's daughter's uh, debt uh reasonable chemistry between them but that's basically all there is between them and we yet were to believe that in the moment where he's going to be leaving on the night before he's going to be leaving his his daughter's uh, fatherless and his wife husbandless he feels the need to be writing motivational letters to yeah. this character it doesn't ring true and the other thing you point about is after the character reads the letter all of a sudden this uh, eureka moment he he changes like it's kind of you see Sam Rockwell he's reading this nice little letter and he's just becoming a different person like I wonder what like what does that suicide 
serve in the narrative of the story. Like the story could have progressed. Like you, you could, like if I was sitting down with a blank piece of paper and I write this story, and I could have written it without. Like Chief Willoughby could have just sort of gone off into the distance here. He didn't have to kill himself, and we could focus on the Sam Rockwell character. It feels like if I'm being cynical. He he killed them off to have the letters for an easy mechanism to sort of move the narrative along. They can just sort of say, "Oh, and you know you've had a tough life, and that's great. Now we get to, we get to move that bit along, nice and easy." There, um, I don't know, I don't know. It, like it just yeah. seems much. Yeah, I think, and sometimes writers can just justify themselves. It's because you come across problems when you're writing. You you come across problems which in which you have to find solutions, and so. That was probably the solution he found, and it's, then he's trying to convince himself, you know, through the letters, and there's loads of exposition you just say in the letters, you know, where he mentions, oh, your dad, your dad died, you have to look after your mother. Straight away, that's the intentionality there is so obvious that he's trying to uh, evoke a sympathy for the character that that and 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 background and understanding. Oh wow, there's something about this guy we don't really know. Like it all seems very manipulative. You're right, and it just he might McDonough might be convincing himself is yeah. Look at I, I'm this is the this is how we're going to solve this problem, and now I just have to find a way to make it true. Where I I don't know if that was his thing, but that's how it feels, and I don't yeah. think he, I don't think he succeeds. Now there are other a few other little other scenes where, um. And which I think well, now we, we won't go too much more onto this, but I think um uh yeah, I think this there's a few little things uh, where we talk about I talked already about the kind of the the, the the feminism that 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 seems a bit misplaced that that he seems to be, be um forwarding in this uh or promoting or it seems to think that this film promotes um but there's also kind of he did get a bit of pushback about his dealings of race because in this uh, you know race is obviously very much as a as a, a subject matter is very much to the fore of this um uh, film because you know uh, there's numerous mentions of of uh, the Dixon character torturing a black person in custody and about his racism and the, what's just kind of interesting is is like the criticisms were like oh my god yet another uh, yet another film about a redemption story uh, for uh, a white guy um, about uh, another film about a race which is which the the focus is on the redemption story of the white guy like the race the racial aspect of the film the focus is on the re- redemption and the actual black characters basically only serve as props for the moral development of the, the white characters and like and there's another element of it where you feel like mcdonough is compensating as well is there because he probably knows he probably realizes this that he hasn't written good he hasn't written good women and, and in in a in a in a film which is uh you know, where, where race is, is obviously a, a big aspect of the film or a prevalent sort of, uh, I would yeah. say, team. Like, the the black characters are just props for the moral development. And also they're kind of, I think, almost a little bit condescendingly, patronizingly, always, always presented as really um, uh, benevolent and nice and just kind of, you know, like what, all the black what, characters. What black really characters are they? The ones the that, 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 that there's, there's Mildred's friend, Oh yeah, and then there's uh, you know, and then there's the guys who put up the little lords, you know, and they're just they're just they're there's one of the policemen as well, like is it one of the chiefs? Oh yeah, yeah, and the chiefs comes in and yeah, just even the way that he he walks in, swaggers in, and starts calling calling the rest of the guys, hey crackers, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it all just doesn't it does none of it rings true, but but like again, Mildred burns down the burns down the police police department and he kind of you know th- this is it's actually the same uh, I think his name is Clark something I can't give a second name but he's the same guy who plays Lester Freeman from The Wire brilliant actor brilliant yeah, actor yeah, yeah. but he comes down and, 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 and says Mildred or did you guys ha- happen to see what happened and like they clearly clearly oh, Mildred yeah, burned down right, the yeah, fire yeah. station clearly she burned it down and and uh and and basically no no we were just at my place we're, we're kind of dating like a Peter Dinklage character Mil- Mildred and he just has this look and I'm like Mm, really now yeah, <laughs> as in did you take the sweets now did you take the sweets lads you know a really kind of unrealistic he'd be bullying like he'd be bullying you're not going to be just like oh no he he naughty little kids now oh and like yeah, that's that's yeah. that's how it, how it came across so 
Yeah, so there is that aspect to it. No, there's nothing wrong. There, there is nothing wrong with with somebody. Um, you know, if he wants to write a redemption story about a white person, I, I, I would, I, I don't think he should not be allowed to do that. But I, at the same time, I totally understand black people rolling their eyes at, oh my god, uh, this is a, uh, you know, this guy pontific- pontificating about race, even though the people were not being represented in this story uh, in any sort of, uh, you know. Yeah reasonable way and uh and yeah oh sure it's the kind of even the kind of change that that the, the dixon character has like in the you know as you say the turn of the sixpence it's like it, it almost feels like such a naive kind of grasp of the social in dynamics of kind of the racial dynamics that goes on in america like a lot of these hatreds are so deep-seated yeah. it cannot be just all of a sudden cured by a simple letter and somebody giving you orange juice at a hospital like yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's the, so you sort of hit on something there that i was trying to think about how to formulate it in my head but you're right in that uh, but he's not he's not american he's like he's in whatever english with irish heritage so this is not something he, he has a very deep understanding of but yet he's writing about it, and you're not like you're not going to get it right. You're not going to do it right. Like I, if I sort of write about something I don't have any personal experience with, I'm going to I'm going to give the sort of the two dimensional version of it. And that's that seems to be what he's what he seems to be be doing now. Um, yeah, like it definitely like he doesn't have that personal experience of it, so it's very hard to actually. He shouldn't be like I. I wouldn't even go there. Basically, that that'd be my approach. Um, yeah, no, no, there's no, like, like I, I know what you're saying, like, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong, like, with uh, a writer trying to, you know, write about people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, people of different genders or people of different races. I think that's what good writers should aim to be able to do. And, and many good writers are able to, uh, to portray characters that, you know, are different from different backgrounds, uh, in yeah. convincing ways. But one thing, interesting thing about McDonough is that I saw an interview that he, a few interviews he mentioned that I don't do backstory. And, um, and I, I remember an interview with Charlie Rose, he kind of asked him like, you know, why do you base a lot of your, your, um, your plays in on rural Ireland? And he goes, he said, this is what he said. Here's the quote. I felt the plays I was writing in London were too close to home. If you're writing something that is too true, uh, or, and he goes, no, correct himself, not too true, but but too based upon your own life or what's happening around you. The possibilities for story can be lost. So displacing a little bit helped let let stories evolve and let characters go places I they wouldn't. Believe. That yeah, doesn't ring true to me at all. That seems like a cop out, doesn't it? A that, complete that cop out. Like that because I don't know it, I don't feel the responsibility to be true to it because I don't know it as well. I don't. It's like it almost but feels I, like I that, feel that, like that's what he's saying. I feel like you have a depth of understanding of what what you've experienced. So that should be where that should be where the, where the most fruitful, you know, the most fertile ground is when it comes to actually writing something. Uh, if you if you're if you're transposing it from wh- what you're used to with something else, you're going with like if I was to write something a story about growing up in England, I'd be t- it'd be uh, it'd be uh, uh, my inspiration would be watching EastEnders and uh, Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels like that'd be what I'd be writing about. You know, I would I've no <laughs> personal experience about like West End gangsters or East End gangsters yeah. or any of this sort of crack. Yeah. So like that's and that's that's nearly what, what, what he has, it's secondary sources basically he has to work with yeah, as opposed I, to the primary I think, material I think he said that that he had been travelling around for America you know that kind of uh, um, you know would you call it rural America, Midwest America, uh, yeah. you know, for a few months, and he got a lot of his uh, cues for the setting there as well. Um, but he, he, another point is that he's kind of flippant as well, because even the little point, you know, the, the, there's kind of a sense of in which he's irresponsible about talking about these topics, where there's another point where he goes, um, uh, where Mil- Willoughby makes a point about the, when, he, when he talks to Mildred about, about the police department, where he's kind of defending Dixon's racism. Um, and uh, he's he's he kind of says, well, look at if you like, he's kind of well, what what can I do? What what can you do? Um, if we got rid 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 oh, of yeah. every policeman with vaguely uh, racist leanings, you'll only have three policemen left, and the rest of those will will hate the fags. And like, there is a part of me saying, no doubt about it, police brutality is 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 a big problem in America. Um, and there's no doubt about it. Like 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 they like I. I don't know from what I read, you know, uh, and I'm not an expert, but from what I read and from what I hear from friends who are 
living in America, there is there is a problem of racism. Like, but for him to just kind of to to make such a sweeping statement yeah. and put it in the mouth of one of the most sensible and, and a character that that ultimately the ends up being quite well, that's the quite character's he'll, he'll view. Though. Like the character is just trying to say, "Oh, what are you going to do?" And the and, but I, I don't. I don't think that's his personal view of the world. I think it's more a case of this is the character's justification for uh, the way things are and just sort of say, look, let's get on with it. It's not right, but it's. I think it's part of the character that, that this is his view of how things... Like, like it, it's a very conservative way of looking at the world. So this is just the way things are and we're like, what, what are you going to do about it? And he's trying to add that element to the character's, you know, building up the character. I think, I think it fits okay in the character sense. Uh, but I agree with you. If it's a commentary in the world, yeah, okay, it's wrong. Yeah, yeah well, look, it's 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 kind of hard to tell, but it's just like it, it is coming from probably one of the the good guy characters um, that you would say that does seem to have a good like you know those three letters. He was so wise in those three letters. So it's coming from like, maybe the wisest character in the whole uh, film, and he's making this kind of you know it's easy for McDonough to I uh, just kind of feel like it's a little bit flip and a little bit. So it was easy for, for him to kind of make a statement about that, about a country whose social dynamics uh, uh, and cultural dynamics he doesn't really know about. He doesn't truly know, know, know about. But look, maybe that's one of the more mi- minor criticisms. I just want to say one more thing about the feminism thing. And then can we talk a little bit about the on PC stuff? And if you have any final thoughts, we'll, we'll take a break after that. If that's yeah. okay. But this will be very short. Like the last point about the feminism thing is that you know, he he says this is kind of kind of fe- like a feminist kind of film, but like as you say that, sh- um, the McDormand character and she's a kick-ass badass and a role model. Like as you said, that that little spiel that she had with the priest, where she says you join the gang, you're culpable. Like essentially, the whole point, the whole idea being forwarded there is that well, nobody's able to criticize anybody. You know, like we're all culpable at some level. You know, like you know. So that's I don't know if that's a philosophy you want to forward. Not whether it's it's maybe it's not just McDonough using. Um, maybe that isn't McDonough's view. Like so, it kind of feels like it. But like that, we're all culpable for what. For you, you know that that, that any any wrongdoing. Remember the priest thing. It goes. You yeah. join the gang. If you join the gang, you're culpable. So you and, and but her whole point was. So you don't get to criticize how I live my life because you're culpable. You 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 also oh, sin. Oh yeah. So but we're all it's wrong kind of, then. Like he, yeah. He, 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 you're a sinner too. So it's so, a bit like uh, let he like you know let him without sin cast the first stone. It's a recasting of that in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is which is kind of a, kind of a, 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 a very naive uh, uh, point by, like like Jesus is basically essentially, and that's you know we're going off track a little bit. <laughs> Jesus is essentially saying that nobody is going to be, nobody can criticize anyone else. You know, anyway, but 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 no, but I agree, I agree with you in the sense that you know, like we're all we're all like we're all, we're all sinners <laughs> in our own way, and. Um, it, like it, it, it's something. definitely a consideration you should take into account. It's like yeah. ev- everyone, we're all a little bit guilty of seeing the the specks in everyone else's eyes, but not seeing the logs on our own. Like you know, I think keyboard warriors on the and, yeah, you know, like we, we, some of us are more guilty of it than others. But, but I, I think I think at the same time though, if you take that that approach, then you're never going to be like like we do something wrong. We should try and. We should try and better ourselves, and what can help us if if you if if somebody helps point that out to you sometimes. So like, I don't think I don't think it's a good philosophy to live the world by. You, you should be called out on things we do wrong, basically. Like that's that I think that's a good thing for everybody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't I don't think that whole culpable argument. I don't it doesn't doesn't. No, I'm not, like me. I'd agree, but then again, it it it, it look it's not not it, maybe it's not McDonald. Maybe he just says this is this is something that this character would think. Fine, it might be flawed. I don't know whether you know, but the the other n- main thing is that what is interesting about the whole thing is if he's going to tackle kind of the subject of rape, like he and there's a, it's a scenario where there is a scene where Chief Willoughby kind of says to um, Mildred, you know, what do you want us to do? Now the problem is like you know, like like it, the the hardest part is to kind of to f- to, f- to find out how these things are happening, and she actually says. Like he doesn't provide any answers about this, and he he in her, the character actually says every male baby that is born, put him on a database, and as soon as he did something wrong, cross reference it, make one hundred percent sure it was correct match, and kill him. Right, that was that's her solution. 
Like that's her, you know, she's angry, she's losing her you know, kind of thing. But but when he is presenting her, um, uh, her, her saying this kind of th- kind of stuff, he's he's also not providing solutions to his his work. He's when his uh, his contribution to this to, to this very very uh, uh, difficult discussion is actually yeah like even when they're looking for clues like you know, like they, they they didn't know have any idea where to, where to, where to, where to look his his contribution is uh, McDonald's contribution really in the present presentation of this work is that there is no real proper solution. So in, in some ways he's reinforcing the the kind of the, the type of thing you hear from the from the the kind of uh, the conservative right wing side. I'm not saying that they did conservatives don't have valid points at times, but he's 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 not reinforcing the kind of the feminist arguments there. Now if he was to talk about like well like when we talk about rape it's like you know how do you best to deal with that? The 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 he said she said kind of law aspect of that is very very tricky. It's very very tricky. But there's there's other ways you could present, like such as which we we have um we have implemented in Ireland such as uh, kind of consent court classes and things like that, which help you know education all that kind of stuff changing you know, a general changing of, of cultural attitudes, all that kind of stuff, which, which, which helps. But there's none of that stuff in this film. In fact, it's kind of like, like if just anything, it, it, it draws to attention that like you kind of, I'm you kind of watching that and you just, you, I'm kind of looking at the, the Mildred character kind of going, yeah, there is yeah like moment, what is there to do? Like There yeah. is one moment where, what are they talking about? Oh, it's the, the thing with the dentist and then she's brought in by the police and then she said, I didn't do it. Looks like it's my word against his. And I wonder is that a relevant comment to um, uh, to uh, um, what do you call it? To like the whole like when it's a rape. Case. Oh yes, it's, it's, yeah. Look, it's like he says, she says. Well, but, but this time the chick ain't losing. She says this time the chick ain't Did losing. She said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so there is there. Yeah. Like, it, but I I I find that to be a kind of almost like a cheap kind of victory like yeah. that he's 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 given the, the, the feminist there it's like this time it doesn't really it doesn't really get to the fundamental problem like you know at hand and like he doesn't provide easy 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 answers yeah f- sure enough fair enough although if, like in this kind of phase phase the the kind of the change that the characters have Seems to be a little bit too easy for my, um, yeah. uh, for, you know, for for me to to fully get behind or fully believe. But, but yeah. Lastly, again, there's a lot of kind of n words, a lot of c words in this. Actually, the w- one thing I wanted to point was the flashback scene, and yeah. then we'll have a break because you, you yeah. mentioned the flashback scene. So there is this flashback scene, and this is goes back to kind of. McDonough not being able to get out of his own way where it's kind of like there, there are some fans of McDonough think that he's brilliant at balancing the humor and um, the humor and the, I suppose the pathos, you know, the kind of dark humor and the pathos and that that ultimately he balances it so well that it ultimately rings true. I disagree. I think that it jars. It does. You know, it doesn't connect like the, that scene where it's kind of like the old. It's a bit of a cliched flashback scene um, where it ends in they having an argument. She won't let her use the car. Um, there's there's jokes about kind of um, a gag about um, there'll be no more C words in this house. And then the son says, oh, so you're, you're moving out. Blah blah blah. Move straight on to, um, you know, d- d- you know, like it's almost like, and the son says, "Just a gag, just a gag," and almost feels like he's he's like that's that's McDonough's voice there. Like I'm just having this. I can't help myself. I can't help myself. Shoehorn in another gag, yeah. you know, uh, during what's supposed to be a realistic kind of argument between, uh, between uh, a parent, mother, and daughter. But, um, uh, what happens is is it kind of like, you know, it ends in uh. Well, like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna walk so, and I hope I get raped, you know. Yeah, and then the mother yeah. says, "Oh yeah," and I hope you get raped too. How convenient that that's exactly what you say. That's that's the memory she has. It's a bit like the, the bloody Home Alone kind of thing. I hope I wake up with nobody, like nobody at home. That's it's so cliche. Like it's kind of yeah. like I hope that, I, and then you know, I wake up and 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 sure enough, all the family are gone. It's such a cliche. It's how convenient is that? That that was the last memory or one of the last memories of 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 her daughter. Um. And then, but then the, the the old father. This is another problem he has with femininity as well. Is that that the the the, the ex husband who used to beat her up, Charlie's his name. He comes in 
uh, there's banter between them, of course, kind of a bit of slagging off, whatever. Um, you get to see his his somehow he's with this kind of 19 year old gorgeous girl who's uh, very feminine and a bimbo because that's McDonough world. If you're feminine, you're a bimbo. Um, you're, you're you're you know you're, you're to be to be a strong woman you have to be you have to be masculine <laughs> like, like you know, that's what it seems to me anyway but but basically it goes from one minute where they're they're kind of um slagging each other off uh, uh and then there is a, 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 a and then all of a sudden it's a tender moment between do you don't think i wish I, we couldn't bring her back and he, and he goes i know you do now i just all of a sudden it's just so like all of a sudden a tonal shift yeah. where it's like well, one minute you're being Aaron Sorkin, you're, you're being a foul-mouthed Aaron Sorkin, and you, you can't just all of a sudden turn into Ken Loach then, like, you know, or, or, or Lenny, or Lenny Abramson. It, just, it, just, just, it, sh- it doesn't work like that. And not for me anyway. Not for me anyway. And it's just, a, it, it just kind of, it's a scene that highlights McDonough's manipulativeness and his, um, I don't know, his inability to, I suppose he to, to avoid inserting himself into into stuff at the expense of the truth of the characters. Yeah, well, definitely there's a sense of that. Uh, one thing then before we wrap up, one thing that that uh, a recurring theme for me in the McDonough films is this overdone climax. Like the climax in this, well, one of the cli- I suppose the climax is the fire or one of the big centerpieces is like the fire. It just comes out. It feels like it's completely you know, a disproportionate level of intensity compared to everything else. Like, it's a slow burner up until that point, then all of a sudden, okay, right, there's a big fire. It just, I don't know, it just doesn't doesn't follow, doesn't ring true from from what comes before. And also, I don't know, why does it have to be a fire? Like, why why does it have to be, like, it just seems completely out of out of out of scale out of proportion disproportionate to what's required in that in that moment in the, in the film yeah but look they might argue it's poetic license and like in any story there's always going to be coincidences and you know it has to be some some kind of like like every like one thing i'll say about mcdonough every line he has uh, it generally has a payoff and is well he he thinks very deeply about his lines you know in terms of but yeah the fire thing and it's the same. It's the same in the other films. Um, like it seems to have, and even the other McDonough. So you're saying that it's it's a contrived uh, kind of uh, dramatic uh, device. Like it comes back to the it comes back to the Seven Psychopaths thing, where he's going, "Oh yeah, now we have the big shootout." Like it's just we need, we need some sort of centerpiece here of something dramatic, and then okay, we have a fire in the police station, and that'll that'll do nicely, and. And, yeah. and it was a slow burner up until that point and it's really nice like it's a really good character development and and nicely paced and then all of a sudden it's sort of okay he wants to get some sort of a climax there but it doesn't I don't know it doesn't it doesn't it's not part of the story really I, I don't know it just doesn't it doesn't feel like this is fits is the best way of going about that but yeah look um, yeah uh, it's over the top. It feels over the top unnecessarily. So, um, and the bit when your man is falls out the window as well. All that maybe sort of stuff. like it's sort of it's supposed to work me- metaphorically, where it's all coming to a head, and the fire represents that it's just it's it, like the anger is not. It's burning more and more. I I, I don't know what he's going for. Like, yeah. it's to represent the fire is there to represent a kind of anger or the destruction uh, that's internally going on in. In uh, Mildred. Mildred's head, I I I don't really know. Um, like, look, as I say, if people are like you know, generally people who who seek out analysis of Martin McDonough's work, it's like I'm if I'm a fan of someone, I seek out analysis of their work, right? Yeah. And if I'm not a fan of someone, I I don't. So people who are, if there is somebody who's real watching this, they're going to like. Obviously, we've been really really critical. Um. Uh, particularly me, probably, but you've been pretty critical as well. Yeah, and uh, they're f- probably not going to like what we're what we're what we're well, saying. One thing I will say in general, like my feeling is, it is better than the average film. Like he is up there as I think. I think they're they're pretty good, but I feel like it's like it's this sort of he's not getting the A honor. He's like he's not hit. He's not absolutely nailing it, but he's like he's a good two one. That's the sort of level I'd be putting him in at, which is better than the majority and pretty good, but just. There are elements here that feel like they're 
you know, room for improvement, essentially. Yeah, it kind of he kind of feels like that piano player or a musician who has incredible musician skip, uh, musician uh, skills. Like they can hit all the notes, they hit all the scales. Um, technically proficient. Technically so. really proficient, but they don't with their music. They don't hit you in the heart. Um, yeah, you know they 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 don't they don't hit the spot, and uh, it feels a little bit like like that with him. But I will say is that if you are, it's a, we're not we're not going to be precious about our critiques. You know we could be pretty wrong about some stuff. So we could have missed a lot of subtext. We could have missed uh, metaphors or missed the points here, and that's fine. Like you know if you want to yeah. uh, make let us make know a, in the comments. Let, let us know in the comments and berate us and trash us. No problem at all. We are we're we're. I t- would like to think we're thick skinned, but we'll, 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 it depends how many yeah. uh, it depends how ne- many negative comments we receive. But look at as as you say, yes, he is. He's still talk talking. He is. He is great at pacing. There's some great scenes as well. I, I do really like Sam Rockwell's performance in this. It's it's always very. He's so watchable. He's also entertaining. I really like that performance. I love that scene where uh, after Chief Willoughby dies, he goes up uh, to. Um, and, and, and throws your man out the window and there's some great song I can't remember the name of the song that was like there is brilliant you know the choice of music here Last Rose of Summer as well like McDonough has a great ear for a good song at the right time yeah I'm know? just going to say and uh, whether it's him or not but yeah yeah. well it's the same with the other films as well the, like, the music does add to the atmosphere and it does like he, it's well paced but then the, the, the music comes in at the right time the right type of music just to give you that right scent, emotional, evoke the right emotions, basically, that go yeah. with, with what you're seeing. Uh, yeah, no, use it. That is excellent. Um, Although, like, uh, music in its own way is, can be manipulative and can. You but know, I don't mind that. Like, that's no, what it's you're there fine. For. But yeah, look at that's it, what it, it's a fine is. line. That's what storytelling is. <laughs> yeah, there is a fine line. But I don't like. I, it's the fine line between manipulation. Because uh, we are, you are being manipulated, but. but no matter what, I suppose in a way your emotions are being manipulated, but like, not. At the, I don't like it when it feels like it's at the expense of truth. You know if that makes sense. And sometimes it feels like that. When you say truth, like um... truth, it's in something that that I believe. Like, like it's, it's like it's, it's it's a vague. And when it comes okay. to art, it's vague. But something that rings true that feels like. Do you know what? I believe that character. I believe that circumstance. I believe that reaction. And 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 you know what I mean. Is okay. No, I get. I get you now. So basically, as opposed to, so if 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 he's being lazy and he hasn't really told developed the character properly, and then he brings in the music to try and you know patch over th- those holes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair. That fair. seems yeah. manipulative. Like, yeah. Yeah. Where if the character has been really well developed, and then the music uh, in in a really dramatic scene for the character, then there's a perfect choice of music, then it enhances the yeah. the experience. It enhances your. You know. yeah, it guides you more towards the motions and uh, of that moment as opposed to yeah okay trying to develop the character in a way yeah yeah, yeah I get you yeah, yeah. exactly so I, I'd say as I say great pacing um, some you know some good dialogue uh, some good banter between characters I also like the scene where he scratches your man's face uh, another Sam Rockwell the highlight of it uh, Francis McDormand his committed performance one note character um but she does the best of what she's given. She, she's like. does, she, re- she, she really, definitely does the very best. Of what yeah, she's given, she makes yeah. a yeah, sick purse out of herself's ear nearly in terms of the dialogue. Mm. Well, I won't, that's going a bit harsh on it, but I mean, some of the dialogue wasn't great, but she really does the best of what she has there. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah, as I say, it's it's still, for, despite all our criticisms, it's still better than the average yeah. film. And I, if Mark, Mark Madonna ever has a new film coming out, I'll always be willing to pay money to go see it because I know. It'll still provoke debate. It'll still be thought provoking, uh, and yeah, give me more reason to be a grumpy uh, grouch. Okay, yeah. grand. Right. All right, so that's the end of part one. We'll take a small break now. That that was longer than we thought. Yeah. I think the next two will be as long. But yeah. thanks very much, folks, and we'll see you for part two. Thanks. thanks.